And welcome to the Daily Space Weather Smash Show here, coming at you from the Smash News Network, least busted name in news. And we've got a filament fest going on. Another uptick in solar activity, new active regions rising in the east, and lots more to cover. We'll even talk about the butterfly diagram briefly on today's Daily Space Weather video. And thanks for tuning in, the viewers. So we've been naming filaments after living people. And we've got some here to point out that are still up there. There's the Rene Gable filament, the originator of naming filaments. Here is the Yay West, or I guess just Yay is his preferred name now. Yay! It's the Yay filament. Down here in the southwest, we've got the Bill Nye filament. Up here, we've got the Zach Toven filament. Over here is the Liver King filament. So we've got quite a few filament names here. Hit us up on Twitter, at SmashOMash, to participate in Name That Filament. We've got more filaments over here. I don't remember the names of them. Sorry, I've uh, lost track. That's why we want them named on Twitter. So we have like a record that we can reference. Again, we've got new active regions rising up here in the southeast. Also, another active region rising in the northeast. That's likely two new sunspot groups in both hemispheres. Don't expect the sunspot number to suddenly dip as we still see indications of more activity rising. So the sunspot number is going to be relatively level today. We have seen some umbral migrations that we'll get to here as well. Umbral migrations happening in this sunspot group up here. And a new sunspot group forming right up here in the northern hemisphere. Also, this new sunspot group down here needs a name. So we will see a fairly flat level of sunspot number here unless something sudden occurs and sudden things can indeed occur. The magnetic environment can suddenly change. I mean, right there you see some sunspots spontaneously forming, other ones spontaneously evaporating. It's sort of a normal thing. And what's not a normal thing is seeing zero sunspots, and that's not what we see. So let's uh, move into some volcano coverage here. So if you're wondering what's erupting, so am I. Subinose Jima starts the list with a 3,000-foot ash plume. It's exploding, flight level 030. Don't pole vault. The caldera, also Krakatau, one of the best volcano names. I mean, Krakatoa, pretty good too. The daughter of Krakatoa, known as Krakatau. Some Strombolian to Vulcanian style activity there at the 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 island of Krakatau, which is basically just a volcanic lagoon. Semeru also erupting, flight level one three zero. That's a thirteen thousand foot ash plume. Semeru explodes. Merapi, flight level one one zero. That's an eleven thousand foot ash plume over. Western Sumatra. Carinci also producing a 15,000 foot ash plume. Kilauea now uh, a back to the effusive eruption from the Halema Uma'u lava lake crater. Whoa, that's a major uptick there. Now it's producing a 23,000 foot plume of volcanic ash. Kilauea there, a big ash producer there. 23,000 foot ash plume, flight level 230. Flight level 150 over Fuego in Guatemala. Flight level 210. 21,000 foot ash plume over Colombia from Nevado del Ruiz. Heading farther south to Ecuador, we've got a 15,000 foot ash plume as, e as Revenador explodes. Also, Saban Kaya continuous emissions. And also, Villa Rica in central Chile. A lava founding event happening there. And let's move to seismic activity, which has been massive in the past few days. A huge amount of earthquakes here, and some interesting ones that we're hoping are not foreshocks, like the 5.0 we covered off the coast of Oregon. That's your past 90 days. It's been quite seismically active. The, last, the largest quake of the past 24 was this 6.0 near the southern slash Pacific Ocean boundary. That one occurred at 1617 Universal Time yesterday the 11th. Let's scroll up the list here. 
And if we miss anything, let us know. Small quakes warm in the Caribbean, in the Caribbean, also Papua New Guinea, at least seeing some quakes there. Let's see, what do we have here? There's a 5.1, not super far away from that 6.0. We also see a 5.5 at Chile. Also, we've got a 5.1 here at Papua New Guinea and a 5.3 at Tonga. That one coming in while we did show prep. And let's get back to space. That first imagery we showed you there, that was a three-way. This is only a two-way. That's 171 plus 193 angstroms from SDO. Calibration move there, hopefully not causing any seizures. Here is our 171 plus 131 angstroms wavelengths. And thanks for leaving comments. One audio and Tin Man 1057. Good morning to you dudes as well. So we're back to space, and guess what? The radio flux now up to 195 solar flux units. Simply not a grand solar minimum. Otherwise, uh, we wouldn't be years ahead of schedule for solar activity. So this isn't any sort of a flat top grand solar minimum cycle. It looks nothing like that. And keep in mind, folks, if Zarkova doesn't understand the inputs on her magnetic model, then it's completely meaningless. If other inputs are discovered, then it's lacking the variables necessary. You can't just analyze a magnetic dynamo if you don't know what the magnetic inputs are. So them's the facts, and that is related to the paper that we're writing that explains the solar sunspot cycle mechanism. Anyway, sunspot number has dropped. It's going to be hovering here around 190. It may come back up a little bit today. Again, we've got active regions rising. There's also a sunspot setting in the west. So we'll, we should be somewhere between 175 and 200 sunspots here throughout the day today and tomorrow. Again, radio flux now at 195 solar flux units, a new high for solar cycle 25. NOAA not forecasting any geomagnetic unrest or geomagnetic storm conditions there via the Space Weather Enthusiast dashboard. Check that out if you want to see it yourself. It's part of the Space Weather Prediction Center. Lots of different data sets available there, like the KP index a measurement of global geomagnetism. It's currently at 1.66. Here's Earth's magnetic moment from space for the past four hours. Again, things are geomagnetically calm here. We've had a fairly steady solar wind. Nothing particularly eventful that I'm aware of, at least in the past 24 hours. It's just been a, st it's fairly clear in between Earth and the Sun right now. So while there are coronal mass ejections, they are not headed toward your doorstep. Here's Earth's magnetic moment from the ground for the last four hours. Nothing out of the ordinary happening here either. We show it daily to help immerse our viewers in facts and data. Because then when something does change, you can actually be aware of it. Not some noob who's looking at it for the first time in their life and saying, Oh my God, it looks so scary. I'm spooked. I'm spooked. I'm letting that play through, by the way, because it refreshed right at the end, and I want a full four-hour run on the video. Because these videos have been archiving this activity for pushing six years. Continuing on to our real-time solar wind, which has been quite unremarkable here. Current conditions are about, about 430 kilometers per second. Solar wind density about 4.3 protons per cubic centimeter. There are your GOES magnetometers. Nothing special there. Fairly smooth readings, which is what you expect. If you're a new viewer, these M's and N's stand for midnight and noontime, local time for the GOES-16 and GOES-18. Next, looking at the heliospheric current sheet. And this can give us some predictive value. It looks like the North Pole current sheet is imminently headed this way. So that does give us some ability to predict what's going to happen in the east. And this is actually better predictive information than even looking at the data from Stereo A. So if you know how to read this imagery because you, oh, I don't know, 
understand physics, that might help. The Top View Ecliptic Plane Field Plot, it's one of the best data sets that we show. Next, our line of sight field plot. It depicts the solar B field in blue, solar polar fields in green for north and red for south, and that moves us to coronal holes. So we've got some north pole oriented coronal holes here rotating in from the east. They have canceled out the south pole oriented coronal holes and overpowered them. So we can expect to see some north pole coronal holes showing up. That's a north pole coronal hole right there. That's my point. That is an SDO calibration maneuver you see there. That is the SDO ensuring that it has its aperture pointed directly at the center of the solar disk. And let's move to sunspots. And where do you see the flare profile? We are almost at a, an M class. We're like halfway to an M class background output for the solar X-ray output. Anyway, there's our sunspot situation. Likelihood of major flares is very high. We've got multiple beta gamma class sunspot groups. Some of those are also beta gamma delta class sunspot groups, the most likely to produce large flares. Again, likelihood of large flares probably higher than 50% overall here. As 3181 sets, it's one of my favorite spots to see a large flare. That's my guess. If we do see an X-class flare in the next 48 hours, we can expect to see it from 3181. That's my stance, and I'm sticking to it until the data shows something differently. Now, here is the sunspot view. We've included SDO continuum and 171 angstroms. That's what causes that little hesitation in the magnetometer. That's the SDO calibration maneuver. And let's look a little closer here. Let's subtract 171 angstroms. This group down here is probably a different sunspot group than this group. I mean, I think it deserves it. Well, maybe not. It looks like it's evaporated, so maybe it doesn't deserve another name. But this group up here certainly deserves a name. So this group right here, right, right there, that little sunspot looks like a sunspot group. That should get a name. This sunspot group down here should get a name that they're certainly both beta gamma delta, uh, beta gamma class. I think this one might even be Beta Gamma Delta class, but in any case, we'll show high-res imagery of that at the end of the video. Here's your SDO magnetogram for the past 24. Ah, and let us know in the comments what coffee you're drinking. Today, we're drinking uh, Cameron's Organic Whole Bean Light Roast. Next, it goes Proton Flux here. Mostly flatlined for the past well, for the past couple of months, actually. No significant proton spikes, just a tiny little relativistic particle event there peaking around 1 a.m. universal time on January 10th. Now, this is what I was talking about. Look at this. The X-ray flux is up to a, a C4, just a background level of C4. It made it as high as background level of C5.2 or so. <clears throat> so if you look at the sudden ramp up here, that is a lot of sunspots producing a lot of photons, X-ray photons. And don't get them confused. I'll say it again. Don't get solar flares and coronal mass ejections confused. They're different phenomenon. Coronal mass ejections are protons. Solar flares are photons. Yes, X-ray photons. Anyway, let's take a look at our flare wavelengths as we've had a number of M-class flares since yesterday. There is the a full disk in composite, 94 plus 131 angstroms. Let's go around the horn a bit. So we'll start in the southeast. Again, we've got a new active region rising here. That is likely a sunspot, if you're wondering. It's producing very large magnetic loops there. And those are typically suspended by sunspots. This time we're going counterclockwise. 
There is the southwestern limb. I like this for large flares, this group here. Uh, as it sets, I would remind our viewers that large solar flares are more likely to occur near the edge of the solar disk as opposed to the middle of it, probably because they're anisotropic. And I won't get into that too much in the video. It is the daily space weather, and it would be verbose to talk about why we think solar flares are anisotropic, meaning a different intensity based on your viewing angle. Anyway, there's the northeast also. This sunspot group has produced an X flare. So lots of areas to produce large flares is the point. There's the full disk view for one more run of the last 24 hours from SDO, the Solar Dynamics Observatory. So take a moment to step back and press like and subscribe if you enjoy the content. We like to orient our viewers to the stars and thanks for stargazing with us. I realized in the mid-1990s that I needed to do a deep dive into heliophysics because it seemed like there are some holes in some theories dating back to the 1850s. Yes, the 1850s. So anyway, that's what's going on above our head in Lehigh Valley. We've got the moon up there and we can't see it because it is a rainy, dreary day in eastern PA. Here's our solar system forecast. That's where things are now. Here's where things will be in a week. We will have a crescent waning moon by the 19th of January. As Earth moves around to the lonely side of the sun, Venus is playing catch up and Mercury is speeding off into the wild black yonder. Next, coronal mass ejections. And we certainly see some. Are they earthly directed? <laughs> well, <laughs> wouldn't you like to know? Just kidding. We'll tell you here in a moment. That was yesterday. Here's today. Another quite spectacular CME there coming out of the north. Is it directly, is it directed toward Earth? Well, probably not, but let's take a look at Stereo A just to verify my suspicions. We'll also look at Lagrange 1, which is the Soho Lasco C3 located here on the right. There's Stereo A. And for you new viewers, if you're not familiar with this imagery, Stereo A puts Earth off to its right. So once again, There's the diagram showing Lagrange 0.5, Lagrange 0.4. This is where Stereo B is located, by the way, but we don't use imagery from that because it's broken since September of 2015 due to a hardware anomaly, probably a coronal mass ejection strike. Anyway, as we move the Stereo A imagery around, we do see one CME that might have some earthly components. Let's check it out. It looks like it's off to the north, though. So let's see if we can get some telemetry on that one. So there it is. That's 7.09 this morning. Let's see what's up with it. Do we see a halo? I don't think so. There's a second CME there, this one down here. And you can see that is on the far side of the sun. There is a signature of that. So you may hear that this has an earthly directed component. I disagree. It is well off to the north. This may create some bad forecasts. That is not an earthly directed coronal mass ejection, in my opinion. Let us know in the comments if you agree, disagree, or are neutral and or don't care. Next, looking at filaments, because we've got a filament fest going on. I mean, we've got the Rene Gable, we've got the Ye, we've got the Bill Nye, we've got the Zach Toven, we've got the Liver King. I don't remember what this one's called, or if there's one up here, I don't know. But in any case, Lots of filaments. Likelihood of coronal mass ejections remains at nearly 100%. Let's bring up the latest image here and do a tweet. Yes, a tweet. We are on Twitter, despite the pathetic and putrid censorship on the platform and on all big tech platforms. You're invited anyway to name that filament. There's the imagery. Feel free to mark it up. And uh, oh my God, we're all the way up to 352 followers. Stop the presses, folks. Next, there's the last 24 hours from SDO and ionized helium, 304 angstroms. I would note the detail of this imagery. You see how high resolution that is. It does have a rather narrow field of view, however. Here's a very wide field of view. That's the past about two and a half hours from the GO-16 SUVI a much wider field of view there. And we're actually looking at 
284 angstroms here. We don't normally show that, <clears throat> but we stream 304 angstroms regularly on the Twitch channel at twitch.tv slash smashamash. Did you know this video was originally streamed to twitch.tv slash smashamash? Well, it was. The live streaming platform works great, unlike certain other, quote, competitor, end quote, live streaming platforms that work like garbage. Next, one of our favorite composites. This is the 171 plus 335 angstroms wavelengths. Two species of ionized iron there emitting ultraviolet radiation. Now, this is invisible to the naked eye. However, the SDO is able to see this. That's why it's in space, because the extreme ultraviolet depicted in these images gets filtered out by the Earth's atmosphere. Spectacular imagery there from SDO, which brings us to our bonus feature segment. Starting out with satellite charging hazards, and we ain't got none. By the way, the FAA problems yesterday, those did not appear to be associated with the electron flux. We thought that the, uh, that the total electron content actually uh, might have contributed to the issues, that they may have caused massive GPS errors, which caused like a, an ongoing issue because, you know, the planes need to know where they're located. They can't use Wi-Fi accuracy, obviously. But there are other instruments besides GPS that helps that helps an airliner, for example, navigate. <clears throat> but it wasn't that. It was just the FAA's uh, software was, you know, not some kind of a software failure. <clears throat> Maybe it was Pete Buttigieg's Windows PC needed to update. Anyway, there's the GOES Electron Flux for the past three days. It's at surprisingly kind of a low levels here. And uh, there is the forecast, NOAA expecting it to remain flatlined, which means you can expect the extreme GPS errors all around the world to continue. We'll show you that in a moment. First, the F layer of the ionosphere. There's the one-year chart of the electron flux, by the way. <clears throat> Next, we'll show the vibrational frequency of the F layer of the ionosphere. That is where the GOES-16 and GOES-18 measure the electron flux. And thanks for leaving a comment, Mike. Good morning to you as well. That's the previous day in vibrational frequency at the bridge between Earth and space where that electron flux is measured. And we're seeing continued anomalies in the ionosphere. Here's the anomaly gram in megahertz from a 30-day median. And our regular viewers are probably already aware the South Atlantic Anomaly is now in the South Pacific, down here just south of the 30 South Latitude line there in the South Pacific Ocean. We've renamed the South Atlantic Anomaly the South Pacific Anomaly because we are on top of data and facts on the channel. Unlike some channels out there which are on, on top of propaganda, grifting, fraud, and nonsense. Remember, folks. There's a fine line between misrepresentation and fraud. They both involve misstating material facts. One's on purpose, one's by accident. You figure out the difference. Next, there's our latest image at the 1215 Universal Time Ionogram and 1215 Universal Time Anomalygram. Next, move into the total electron content. Why? Because it's out of whack. We've got low levels of electron flux, which is associated with massive GPS errors. We've covered it repeatedly on the channel. We can even forecast your GPS errors at this point. The total electron content depicts the electrons between your GPS satellite and your handset. Feel free to pause the video on this frame if you are not familiar with the distance in miles to various things like the SDO and the International Space Station's orbital levels and things like that. So here's a total electron content forecast. Once again, that is the free electrons from ground level up to about 12,500 miles of altitude. And they are all over the place. I mean, huge GPS errors here on a global scale, around the equator at nighttime, around the poles all day long. I mean, just electrons massively out of place. Them's the facts. Also, an interesting anomaly here, not there, an interesting anomaly here over the Caribbean. You'll see that forming around noontime. That's been there for several days. Also some weird anomaly, like a rift here over the North American continent. You see that? That's another oddity. 
So I'm going to let this play through one more time here because there are ongoing anomalies here with the total electron content. A lot of free electrons not in their normal location. It looks like a coronal hole high-speed stream situation, but there is no coronal hole high-speed stream to speak of. So that's your total electron content forecast. Next, briefly mention the sunspot cycles. The butterfly diagram is what we're getting at. You can find this document yourself. It's titled, it's the Marshall Space Flight Center, the sunspot cycle. It's from a few years ago, back in uh, 2017. And the important feature that we're bringing up here before we look at the sunspots that are currently on the closest star, I just wanted to bring up the butterfly diagram. Now this is an indication that solar sunspot cycle 25 will not be nearly as weak as solar sunspot cycle 24 because this is what happens in a sunspot cycle, folks. At the beginning of a cycle, you get sunspots at high latitudes, meaning far from the equator. This is a geographic diagram. And as you reach solar minimum, your sunspots get very close to the equator and you get very few at high latitudes. At the moment, we're continuing to see lots of sunspots at high latitudes, meaning very far from the equator. And that is yet another reason why you are not witnessing a grand solar minimum. So for everybody who keeps forecasting it and forecasting it and changing their forecast and moving their goalposts and acting like they were right the whole time, unpaint yourself from that corner and move on with life because you're not fooling anybody. You're just making a fool of yourself. When the data completely refutes your hypothesis, abandon your hypothesis. It's probably a dead end and move on. Next, our latest intensity gram and latest magnetogram. So we've got this active region rising down here. Is it already a sunspot? And the answer is not yet. However, this group will get a name. So let's uh, take a brief trip here for magnetic complexity. So that is still beta gamma delta class. And that is highly likely to produce some large solar flares as it sets. This group up here, also beta gamma delta class. It's already produced X class flares. Don't be surprised to see more, although it has lost some magnetic complexity in the past few days. It is still beta gamma delta class. These groups over here, that is beta gamma delta class, 100%. And this group down here, is at least beta gamma class. Let's check the northern sunspot groups as we do our clockwise rotation here. That's beta gamma class. I think, yeah, that's beta gamma delta class at the moment. And that's beta gamma. That's beta gamma. So, yeah. Likelihood of solar flares remains very high. Likelihood of coronal mass ejections nearly 100%. And let's move to Earth. So, you know, about 15 years ago, I realized that forecasting the weather is way too easy. I needed additional challenges. And that's not the only reason why I went into the realm of heliophysics. It's also because of the implications on cosmology. I mean, yeah, the uh, cosmology. I almost majored in stellar cosmology back in the mid-1990s. When I was in third grade, I was frightened of the galactic core. Then I learned physics. But in any case, I nearly majored in stellar cosmology in college. The only reason I didn't is because I would have had to have moved to some other state. I think there was only one university in the entire country that was offering stellar cosmology as a major in 1994. So I decided to pursue other athletically oriented goals instead. So what we're looking at here is sea surface temperature as well as currents. So the animation is the currents. The coloration is the sea surface temperature. And what we're looking at is the most important climatological feature of the northern hemisphere. So right there, I've circled the Gulf Stream. Why? Because the geologic record indicates that if the Gulf Stream shuts down because there's too much fresh water coming down like this, 
If the Gulf Stream gets blocked off, guess what happens? It gets very cold in Europe. And that cold spreads all across Asia, comes all the way around the Pacific, and glaciates the Northern Hemisphere. Yes, the AMOC, the the uh, what the heck does it stand for? The Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. That is a uh, positive feedback mechanism for cold. And what happens is you get fresh water from Greenland, makes it down here. If that AMOC shuts down and the Gulf Stream is, is cut off, the first thing that happens is Iceland and Ireland freeze. And then the rest of Europe freezes. And then Asia freezes. And then North America freezes. That is the way, apparently, according to the geologic record, the snowball earth scenario occurs. Is the Gulf Stream shutting down? Well, certainly not. Did we see a year without a summer last year? Well, certainly not. So stop believing nonsense on the internet. There's the Gulf Stream. It's just fine. Europe is not freezing. In fact, it was quite hot this summer. A bunch of high temperature records were broken. All right, let's continue on here to take a look at the jet streams. It's normally what we use the nullschool.net map for on the channel. Nullschool.net's splentacularly fantabulous Earth wind map. Just great stuff there. We've got some backward jet stream here blowing over the equatorial Oceania region of the planet. There is the surface wind scenario. Heavy winds in the northern Pacific Ocean. It's a windy, stormy day in the outer Aleutian Islands. Here are the surface winds of the west. Huge cyclonic low-pressure system there off the coast of California, bringing some uh, definitely unwanted precipitation to the northern part of the state, especially. We'll talk about it. There are the jet streams of the west. And some cold air being driven into the central U.S. there, making it to the Mississippi Valley as we speak. There are the jet streams of the central world. And there are the surface winds of the central world. It's a windy day on the Caspian, also in the North Sea. It's a terrible day. It's a terrible day for Viking raids. That is a bad day for a longboat. If you're wondering what the wave height is, it is uh, yowzers. Let me know if you're doing some surfing at Ireland, as there are 35-foot waves just off the coast. Let us know if you've donned your wetsuit to do some Irish surfing. Yes, Irish surfing. It's a thing. I'm sure it's a thing. Somebody has to be doing it. Next, clouds and fog over croissant earth projected onto NASA's fraudulent spherical map. Yeah, Earth, it's croissant-shaped. What, do you believe in NASA's lies? Pfft. It was formed by actual Nazis, folks. Oh, my God. Aren't you familiar with Operation Paperclip? NASA, they're lying about the shape of the planet. That's what's going on over the western portion of croissant Earth. And let's check our weather.gov map. I'm going to scroll down so you can see the key. We've got some winter storm warnings for northern Maine and winter weather advisories for large portions of New England. Anyway, there's your key. Looks like some wind advisories and things there. Again, if your county is lit, click your county. I say it every day. It's weather.gov. And here are some forecasts. So first we're looking at the accumulated positive snow depth change for the next 72 hours based on the GFS model. Heaviest snow expected for California there. Uh, I don't think you need it anymore, but you're going to get another two plus feet. So just in case you were looking for additional snow there, especially in the eastern portion of the state, that's your 72-hour GFS accumulated snow depth change forecast in inches. Here is your total accumulated precipitation forecast. We talked yesterday about how if that precipitation just shifted a little bit to the east, it would be very bad for Northern California. Uh, that has not really happened, thank goodness. But there are still several inches, like five inches expected in large portions of the state. 
That's your GFS total accumulated precipitation forecast in inches. We'll also show the pressure and precipitation forecast to tie it all together as there's a low moving straight toward Maine. Meanwhile, that low hovers off the California coast, very slowly lurching to the north there. At the end of three days, it's still going to be off the coast of Oregon. Again, hopefully the 5.0 magnitude earthquake that we saw at Oregon was not a foreshock to a larger Cascadia fault zone event. Earthquake watch, folks. Earthquake watch. Here's our precipitation type as depicted on windy.com, who's got a great mobile app, by the way. Install it on your junkware smartphone, whether it's Android junkware or Apple iOS junkware. Windy.com. So that's our uh, precipitation type map. And let's actually let this advance here. I'm going to just slowly allow that to advance. See that north just creeping up the coast there. We can expect some mixed type of precipitation, rain with snow. There's some ice involved as temperatures have been kind of warm here, at least east of the Mississippi. And that is where things will be on Saturday. Some heavy ice storms there coming to uh, portions of central Canada. There's where things will be on Sunday. That is Sunday at 12 noon. And some ice pellets expected to be falling on Long Island. Yeah, Long Island. Wait a minute. That's not Long Island. That's Nova Scotia. Yeah, Nova Scotia. Shout out to Ricky Julian and Bubbles. Continuing on, a look at lightning. And we've got some active cells in the U.S. We had some heavy lightning there, especially in Kentucky and Indiana. That's our NASA GOES lightning mapper. And we do have some terrestrial strikes currently occurring in Kentucky, Ohio, Indiana, and Mississippi, maybe even Louisiana. It looks like the most active cell is this one. Let's take a look. Hey, Jackson, there's thunder rolling in. That is quite an active cell there. Could be experiencing things like damaging wind and hail with that many lightning strikes. That is the current location. It looks like it's moving to the north, northeast. Lightningmaps.org. Yes, you can use it to forecast thunder and look like a horror movie villain. Do you want to appear as Count Yorga at your next gathering with the natives? Do you want to convince the natives that you're Zeus or perhaps Thor? Lightningmaps.org can help you out with that. Next time you hear thunder, check I don't care if you check it out or not. I, I really don't really care. Although we don't want our viewers to get struck by lightning. Now, we do want our viewers to assist the channel. So if you are looking to support the content, then become a member of the Smash Team at smashomash.com slash smash team. We launched it back in October of 2021 because, not because Patreon was bad. It wasn't because of censorship. We just needed additional capabilities. So now we've got massive capabilities on our own web ring that we started building in 2019. That was when we launched smashamash.com. Smashamash.com slash smash team is our own personal subscription services site. Support us that way. And by the way, if you uh, become a gold annual paid up subscription member, there's complimentary merch. It's like equivalent to having four months of a gold membership for free. There's an example of the complimentary merch that you can choose. There's also a, a women's scoop neck t-shirt or a hat that you can pick from if you do do an annual gold paid up subscription. Thanks to everybody who has. Smashomash.com slash smash team. And today's featured product is the Smash Team design. It's a little bit different than the one I'm wearing because the one I'm wearing is exclusive for gold annual paid up subscribers, but you can still support the channel with this Smash Team design. And I've got a bedspread. I've got a, actually, I've got the DeVay cover with this design on it. Maybe we'll show you that at a later time, producing a promotional video. 
Thanks especially to our gold and silver Smash Team members. There's also a bronze membership. If you are unable and or unwilling to open your cobweb-encrusted wallet and drop us a few bucks per month to produce the most detailed imagery of the sun and comprehensive space weather in the known universe. Why did it stop scrolling? I didn't do it. It just spontaneously stopped scrolling on its own because reasons. If you click the link below the video, you'll find our merch to the Red Bubble Shop. There it is in order of best selling. And if you think I'm some kind of political hack, pulling some kind of political line for a party or an oil company or some other nonsense like that, think again. Never been associated with a political party, likely never will. I'm a pragmatist who likes facts and things that work, hence the term pragmatist. Congratulations on surviving a global whatever. So far, you're doing a fine job. Congrats on not being dead. If you enjoy the content, press like and subscribe. Press share. Tell your friends and foes about the content. There are playlists featuring all kinds of things, like the 12 Days of Smash Miss. Those playlists often include information that has nothing to do with space weather or meteorology, so check those out. More lifestyle videos coming soon to the channel. Thanks to our new subscribers, our old subscribers, thanks to our friends, and thanks to our foes. Smashomash.com is the official website of the Smash News Network, least busted name and news, so welcome to the Neo Renaissance. Welcome to the Neo Renaissance, folks. Facts. They're now controversial. Welcome to 2023. Again, congratulations on not being dead. We are still on Patreon as well. <laughs> if you want to support us that way, we still do have a Patreon. And Smash Staff will be creating some posts on Patreon soon as we produce more and more additional content for our viewers. So we'll close out the video today with U.S. Doppler radar, clouds and fog, and water vapor. There is Doppler radar for the states of ALSA, the allegedly United States of America. There is clouds and fog. You can see that low is making its way uh, into Illinois as we make the video. And there is the water vapor map that should make things a little bit more obvious. If your Doppler radar is not giving you the full picture, check out the water vapor map. It's part of the NASA GOES Interactive Weather Satellite Suite. Here's your recap to close things out. U.S. Doppler radar showing vertical motion of water droplets in the air column. Shortwave radiation in the infrared spectrum at 3.9 nanometers. And lastly, water vapor. It shows all the water vapor. And it's looking like clear skies over Galveston at the moment. Well, anyway, thanks for tuning in, folks. Congratulations once again on realizing the channel exists, despite the pathetic efforts by certain organizations to silence us. Anyway, we'll join you tomorrow for another similar video, God willing. And thanks for tuning in once again as I sign off from the Smash News Network. Least busted name in news. May that solar wind be at your back. Fact the press by Big Tech in this video, not necessarily the opinion of Smash News Network, least busted name in news. Oh no, the galaxy! No, galaxy! Ah!